Uh, we're continuing on with our uh, uh, Market Situation Outlook series. Uh, we'll be monthly throughout 2021, uh, building on something we started just as COVID hit. Um, we're going to have four speakers today, and just that's especially because we're a little bit late, I'm going to hand it right over to Brian. Yeah, I noticed a, uh, thanks Dave. I noticed a typo. This is the uh, fertilizer price that's headed into 2021, not 2011. So it's not an outlook from uh, 10 years ago. So a little typo there, sorry about that. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and get right into it. But uh, what I just wanna talk about today are the, the major fertilizers, uh, potash, phosphorus, and nitrogen. Kind of what's happened with prices, perhaps answer some questions that have come up uh, with regard to fertilizer prices and, and what's been happening and uh, show some charts, you know, reflecting on where we are now versus where we were last year. So next slide, please. So first I'm gonna talk about our phosphorus fertilizers. So I'll start with uh, DAP uh, 1846. And if you look the on the left-hand side of all these charts, uh, you'll see this tiny little red uh, line. And that's the start of this year. So that's 2021. So the green line is 2020. The purple line is 2019. That gray dashed line is the five-year average. And then again, that tiny little red line on the left, because we barely have a couple of weeks into uh, 2021, that's, that's this year's. And you can see that DAP is, is above the five-year average um, and quite a bit above right now in January, where it was uh, this summer when it was down around $4, uh, $410 per ton. And then we saw this big increase <coughs> in DAP heading into the end of the year through October, November, and December. And then here in January, uh, it's increased a, a little bit as well. Still below where we were last year, which was closer to about $510 a ton, uh, but above that five-year average. Uh, and this is for the week ending um, uh, January 8th. And then my next slide is uh, uh, your map. And I have, I know I have DAP in parentheses there. That's bad editing. So this is a uh, map monomonium phosphate 1152. And it, just like DAP, it's, it's, it's quite a bit above, but relative to last year's price, MAP is even higher. MAP is up around $540 per ton uh, to start the year, which is above 2019 and considerably above that five-year average. So you look at that, you see that little red spike on the left-hand side of the graph. And that's, uh, that's where it was as of about a week ago. And again, same thing, that big run up starting uh, into October, November and December, we saw uh, phosphorus prices going up uh, and MAP going up relatively higher than, than even DAP did. Uh, big reason for that is, and I'm gonna talk about it here a little bit towards the end, is uh, just what's happened with phosphorus prices versus uh, nitrogen prices and uh, MAP has less nitrogen than DAP. All right, so my next slide shows uh, potash prices. Now this is, it's, it's above that five year average as well. You see the little red line there to the left approaching $370 a ton. Again, above the five year average, but below 2019 prices where it was closer to $380 a ton at this point last year. But it also came up as well. If you look at the green, um, starting around uh, November where it kind of bottomed out, uh, potash prices have come up pretty remarkably from 330 to $360 a ton in just about a month and a half or so, and then all the way up to $370 a ton here recently. So we've seen potash prices uh, increase as well. And then my next slide shows the cost of nitrogen per pound. Uh, if we can move the slide forward real quick. Thanks. So this is the cost of nitrogen per pound. Uh, and this shows four nitrogen fertilizer products. Uh, it's a, a chart that DTN puts out. You've got anhydrous, which is green versus urea, which is red. Uh, UN, uh, 28 is orange and 32 is blue. And nitrogen prices have been pretty much a steady trickle down since last February. Uh, and yes, they've, they've rebounded some uh, here recently per pound, but uh, again, quite a bit lower than they were last year. And I have a chart that kind of breaks this down on the percentage change year over year, which we'll look at in the, in, in the next couple of slides. So my next slide then shows a specific uh, nitrogen product widely used here in North Dakota in urea. And compared to, again, this has that little red line on the left-hand side of the graph, uh, below the five-year average headed into 2021. 
And that's because we had this big drop in uh, nitrogen prices here in the last few weeks. So the 2021 price is quite a bit lower than uh, uh, 20, 2019, okay? So urea prices are down uh, and, and that's what we saw with those other nitrogen fertilizers. And then my next slide uh, shows starter fertilizer, so 10340, and it's right at that five-year average. So there was a big run-up right before the start of the year, and then we had nitrogen prices come right back down in the last few weeks. So they've come down considerably just in the last few weeks from $530 per ton for starter down to about 400 and let's call it 65 or 70 uh, looking at the chart. So we've got a bit of a mixed bag where we've had these phosphorus prices uh, as the year uh, ended, as 2020 ended, headed into 2021, ramping up and staying higher. Potash as well. And then nitrogen prices ran up and then have come right back down uh, considerably uh, over the last uh, few weeks. So a bit of a mixed bag in terms of what fertilizer prices are doing depending on the product. So there's not this universal increase versus universal decrease. There's a bit mixed with phosphorus being higher and uh, nitrogen fertilizers being lower. And then my next slide is kind of a table showing exactly relative to last year, uh, exactly what the, the prices have done. Uh, next slide, please. So we look here, DAP uh, is up 11%, and this is one year uh, change, percentage change from a year ago. DAP's up 11%, MAP up 22.5%, uh, Potash uh, basically even, down 1%, almost 2%, uh, basically even. Urea up very slightly compared to last year, up almost 3%. Uh, starter fertilizer down almost 3%. And, uh, anhydrous, which is NH3, down 3%. And then 28 down uh, much more at 12% and 32 down 8%. So again, that's what I'm showing you. This mixed bag of nitrogen fertilizers for the most part are lower than they were this time last year. Uh, phosphorus uh, quite a bit higher as much with respect to like map up 22.3% uh, relative to this time last year. And, and actually a lot higher than they were this summer and early fall. This is relative to last year when they were higher than they were say in July of 2020. Next slide, please. So one of the reasons for uh, what's happened was the a production cut. They've had they had these lower fertilizer prices now for uh, quite a while, especially if you look at it in a historical perspective. And one of the things that ha happened, and this wasn't a obviously a uh, price driven decision, but the supply of phosphate declining in China due to COVID nineteen in uh, Hubei province. So that's affected, you know, world supply. That's a big producer of uh, phosphorus uh, fertilizers in the world. And then Mosaic reduced phosphate production in Florida, Louisiana, and then the potash mine in Canada in late 2019 into early 2020. So they reduced production to basically get supply in line with demand and help uh, improve uh, uh, price. And there's a lag when you do those kind of things, okay? And so as a result, uh, some of this big run-up we saw in the fall, and I'm going to get into it uh, in a minute, was we had a production cut to try to Im improve prices for fertilizer dealers uh, early last, early 2020, late 2019. And then, of course, we had this fall this year in 2020 where it was drier, uh, the, the weather was warmer, and farmers were able to go in and do a whole lot of uh, work and catch-up uh, application. There, there were reports, and I, and I have an article that uh, I've read. I read about it that, you know, some guys were delaying their phosphorus applications uh, that they would have put on uh, to help cut costs in some of these leaner years. And then they looked at this year where they had a better cash flow position and the weather to support this fall big fall application. And so that's what happened. So you had a production cut, if you will, if you want to call it a production cut. And then you had a big increase in demand this fall over what we've seen the last few years, just created this scenario where uh, it wasn't that there we were short on fertilizer or anything like that. It's that you got to get it where it's needed relatively quickly so you can create these short term periods of somewhat of a, a deficit or, or a, a excess demand and it drives prices higher in, in certain localities. Next slide, please. 
So again, factors contributing to these higher prices, and this is as per a DTN survey, that many farmers took advantage of the dry fall in the Corn Belt and the ability to apply uh, anhydrous post-harvest. And 73% of their respondents, and this was you know, in the Corn Belt area, stated they had already bought or were going to buy fertilizer before the end of uh, 2020. That should have said before the end of 2020 there. So they'd already purchased the fertilizer or they'd already bought it and applied it. Then you have tax implications on pre-pricing some of these inputs. You're looking at the fact that uh, you got the CFAP payments and you got maybe even some more of MFP2 in the early part of 2020. And then we had a big uh, commodity price rally in the fall. So it was an opportunity to go ahead and pre-price these inputs that gets trickled through the market, driving prices uh, higher. And then some, uh, again, taking advantage of the higher grain prices with phosphorus, that's what I said before, uh, catching up a little on phosphorus applications that they may have delayed or reduced in years past, waiting for an opportunity like this to go ahead and reapply the, uh, the amount of phosphorus that, that if they had a deficit going. Uh, and then, of course, then one last thing, the river, there were some areas on uh, the river where uh, Mississippi, uh, uh, mainly where there was some closures with the locks and other other problems. And so it was hard to get barges for a period of time up north uh, from the NOLA uh, port down south. And so that caused some logistical challenges and increased uh, fertilizer prices late fall, early, early uh, 2021. Next slide, please. Then of course you just have higher commodity prices and higher commodity prices make uh, local retailers of, of certain inputs believe that folks are willing and able to pay more. And so you might get a little bit of a, a price bump uh, from these guys trying to recoup maybe some of the losses that they've seen in years past uh, because they, there's this opportunity with higher commodity prices and the knowledge that folks are coming in and wanting to take advantage of the dry fall and the favorable conditions for applying uh, your spring requirement of fertilizer and being able to get into the field and get field work done very early. Next slide. Then another thing that came out was this article, and this is taken as a direct quote from a DTN article, which I think they got from someplace else. But the fact that phosphorus prices in the US jumped in November, and part of that, it, I think this is part of it, not all of it, was the Department of Commerce's announcement uh, at the end of November that it's uh, doing an investigation in the countervailing duty on imports of phosphorus fertilizers from Morocco and Russia, where one country, Morocco, faces uh, tariffs or duties of 23.5%, while Russian-based products ranged from 2020 to as high as 72.5%. So while this may not have a, a huge impact on the overall supply of phosphorus coming in or phosphate fertilizers coming in, it's still a factor and people trade on all kinds of different information and knowledge. The expectation maybe this creates some kind of shortage or increased duties for Morocco, who knows what, what, what they're actually thinking, but it could have had an impact on, on overall phosphorus prices. And then my final slide, uh, talking about prices heading into the spring, uh, there may be some softening of wholesale prices into spring for both phosphorus and, uh, and nitrogen. And the, the big reason for that is, like I said, we had this big, uh, spike in demand this fall and pre-pricing that took place in the fall. And so this big increase in prices for that reason. And if a bunch of guys got into the field, if a bunch of producers got into the field, got the fertilizer applied that they needed to get applied, we may see this spring where we have a big softening or, or a, a reduction relative to the last few years on the amount of fertilizer necessary or that folks feel is necessary to be applied, softening prices uh, quite a bit. But the one caution I would say with that, if you're holding out, any weakening in prices may be tempered somewhat by international demand. So if prices begin falling pretty dramatically, kind of what happened with uh, nitrogen fertilizers, and then if phosphorus winds up falling uh, in the next month or so, uh, some of these companies are gonna be looking to export it where in, to countries where, uh, where they maybe are willing to pay a lot more. So we get some smoothing that happens. So the spiking that happened was kind of a regional thing, a, uh, a domestic uh, logistics issue. And any reduction I don't think is gonna be as dramatic because we'll see some, some retailers or, or basically wholesalers looking to move and export any, any fertilizers if the, if the prices soften too much. 
So with that, I, uh, I can go ahead and uh, perhaps take a question or two uh, if there is any in the chat box. Otherwise, I'm turning it over to uh, Tim Petrie, I believe. Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. Just go to my first slide, if you uh, would, please. Um, I've had a number of co uh, comments lately from people saying, now that the vaccine is rolled out for COVID, uh, you know, the retailing will go back to normal and restaurants open and so on. And uh, therefore, uh, cattle prices should be much less volatile than they were, say, last year or whatever. And... Uh, I uh, do not really agree with that and uh, show you some of the reasons why in a minute. Uh, the, you know, the backgrounding decisions have already been made. Uh, cattle are being backgrounded or already sold or this week we got huge sales, 7,000 head to kiss yesterday. So that decision is over. So I wanna take kind of a longer run approach and look ahead to the calf market for uh, 2021 this next fall and just show you all of some of the different things that can happen that are gonna affect the market and likely cause it to be volatile. But anyway, here's the five to 600 pound steers of North Dakota the last three years. Just like uh, Brian said, that little red line way on the left-hand side is this year we didn't, uh, color code this in advance or whatever. And actually my last year's is purple instead of his green. I switched the, those two around. But anyway, there's the purple line was last year. In fact, when you go to fall, you see the last couple of years uh, have not been that great. Obviously you cattle producers know that. <clears throat> I think though it was quite a feat for us to stay at the last half of the year. Uh, in, in 2020 at 2019 prices with all the things going on. Uh, you see in the top there, I see that, you know, the last three years, 2017 isn't on this chart, but 17, 18 and 19, we hit right at 180 and then declined into October like we usually do. And we would have done easily 180 in 2020 because we we're already at 177 there by the end of February before the pandemic hit. And we would have likely followed that blue line across there, which is 2018. So again, looking ahead right now, for 2021, I'm saying as of now, I'm using those 2020, uh, those uh, 2008, 2018 prices as a guide, but a lot of things can happen. So go to the next slide. Uh, the two biggest fundamental factors that affect fall or any time calf prices our slaughter steer prices and corn prices. So I'm gonna talk about uh, both of those plus a couple other factors. So anyway, here are slaughter steer prices uh, and uh, the purple line again is uh, last year and it was all over the board. We started off the year the same as the last two years. And again, we would have stayed quite likely on that light blue 2018 line averaged around 117 or so. And, uh, you know, everything was going so great into February and then the pandemic hit and all the volatility. But again, looking ahead to uh, fall and what calf prices might be, I think we need to hone in on those red squares there, which is the live cattle futures market and uh, you, you see the cash market here we're starting off the year at 112 and that's about where the February futures are but then by April we bring them up there to uh, 118 and 117 today I guess they're just off a of hair and then can continue higher than the last three years averaging about 120 on those particularly from the June futures on we are higher than uh, last year and so that is supportive to calf prices. However, that's again going back to, uh, you know, that vaccines kicking in and more restaurant, hotel, institutional trade going and good consumer demand. It's also based on record exports that are now predicted. And uh, 
you know, and you know, that isn't a done deal either. We've got a new administration in Washington. And so what's going to happen to trade is, is very uncertain. And you know, how much do the restaurants come back and all that. So there, you know, it looks positive now, but a lot of things can happen, which would cause volatility. So go to the next slide, please. Um, Another supportive factor is that uh, our calf crop has declined the last two years and, you know, 19 and 20, likely to decline again in 2021. We'll know more about that for uh, next month's talk. You see up there in the top, the National Egg Statistics Service has a cattle inventory report. Actually, uh, cattle producers are being surveyed now. That'll be released January 20. 29th, that'll tell us how many cows replacement heifers, everything else by state that we have in the U.S. And so uh, tune in on the webinar in February or next one, and I'll have a, a, a summation of what that says and maybe how many calves we'll have. So go to the next slide. The other big issue that we have, of course, is weather. Here's the drought monitor that just came out this morning. And uh, start off on the top there, you see how we know how dry it is in North Dakota, but, uh, you know, misery has company there. And we pretty much most of the Western U.S. is extremely dry. There's a lull down there. They've had some, some unseasonable snows even down in Oklahoma and Texas here in the last few weeks. I just talked to my counterpart down there this morning and, you know, things aren't that bad down there. But a lot of the U.S., is uh, very dry. So uh, this could impact calf prices. If it does rain, you even look over into the Western Corn Belt there, into Iowa, very, very dry and in uh, Northeastern Iowa and even a little bit to slice in there into uh, the other ice states, Illinois and Indiana. So uh, that certainly is a concern from the cattle side. Go down to the bottom, the dark green is major cow-calf areas, and then the red over the top of that is where there's drought. You see on the bottom left there, just about half the beef cows now are in an area of drought. So if that continues and, you know, we need rain, as it shows you there on the, towards the right-hand side, we absolutely need rain this spring and a lot of it just to get back to normal. If that doesn't happen and the drought expands, that, you know, be earlier movement of calves to market likely and liquidation of cows. And that always uh, is has a negative effect on the market. And then from the corn side as well, what's the, what's the weather going to be in the corn belt on what kind of a, a corn crop are we going to have? We need a record corn crop. So go to the next slide, please, to finish up there. Uh, most of you in agriculture are aware that uh, corn prices went from a very low level in through the summer and then by August have started increasing. And so uh, what I will say is the old rule of thumb holds true of change corn 10 cents change fall calf prices a buck in the opposite direction so certainly we have to to uh, watch corn and i suspect it will be volatile but uh, i don't know anything about corn and so with that we're going to let the expert tell us what's going to happen to corn so go ahead frayne all right well thank you tim i don't know if i'm i, I don't know if i qualify as an expert but i'll do my best here uh so i wanted to give a a, a kind of a review of the information that we got in the a uh, couple of days ago in the January USDA reports, uh, and and more importantly, give some implications for what does that mean as we move forward. So, as a reminder to everybody, last Tuesday there were four major reports that USDA released. Now, those four reports are always scheduled for this time of year. It's just this year, each one of those four reports had some surprises in it, some numbers that we weren't really expecting. The market wasn't quite prepared for as far as magnitude of change. Um, and that's really what's what's now put a new fire into the marketplace. And, and as we move forward, it's gonna have some implications on what that means. So on my first slide, I'd really like to take a half a step back and, and remind everybody, so why is it that the, these US re, do, USDA reports are so influential? Why is it that the marketplace spends so much time focusing on these numbers? And there is a reason. And most of the time when I talk to farmers, they get really frustrated because as soon as the USDA report goes out, it seems like the prices always go down. Well, this is an example where, no, it doesn't always go down. This is an example where obviously it had gone up. So uh, 
before I dive into the numbers, I do want to give this perspective, this kind of this higher, higher view of what's going on. The reason the USDA numbers are so important to the marketplace is number one, the procedures, the process that's used to develop these estimates is transparent. We know the process that's used. If I were to ask a private uh, uh, forecasting firm, well, how'd you come up with that number? Uh, I, I'd usually get the line, well, it's proprietary information. I'm sure I, sorry I can't share it with you. But when it comes to the USDA process, we know how they're doing it. And the important thing is it's not a perfect process, but it is very statistically defensible. It's, it's statistically valid. So for, as a researcher, I understand the process they're using. Again, these are forecasts, they're estimates, but the process is sound. The only other comment I'll make, qualification, is the, the procedures have been put together and they're followed, the same process is followed every year. They're tweaked once in a while, but these, these processes or procedures work really well when we have typical or normal conditions. Okay, if we have a very unusual year, if we have something very abnormal, if you have an extreme drought or extreme flooding, or now, you know, more recently in the case of a, a, a trade war, the, the procedures, the, the math behind how they collect the information and how they report the information, it, it, it doesn't work as well, okay, because of this uh, un, unusual, pro, unusual um, conditions. So when we see something different, something unusual, there's always a lot more debate about what the right number really is. Um, the other thing you got to remember is, you know, the question, well, why can't USDA do a better job? Why is it that they're making these estimates? And there's always a trade-off between the cost and accuracy, cost in the, in the form of the financial cost, but also in the time and effort it takes to, actually to collect and prepare the information. And we all know that USDA has been under some budget issues, budget constraints. And so they've really had to try and prioritize where do they spend their money when it comes to collecting information and analyzing that. The second key point is, you know, USDA is a very large agency. Um, based on my, my quick search, there's about 100,000 employees within all of USDA. That's all of the branches. Now, obviously not all of those people are working on data that goes into these reports, but there are pieces of it that do. There's, there's components to it that do flow into the, the, the numbers that we got on, on, on Tuesday. These employees are also scattered over about 4,500 locations in the unit US and internationally. My point of bringing this up is that there, to my knowledge, there's no other private company that has these kinds of resources or the, the level of analysis that USDA does that provides to the evaluation of what's going on in the US as well as internationally. The other thing that's interesting is, you know, the information's free, right? And everybody gets the access to that information at the exact same time. So there's no um, leakage or anything. The USDA works very, 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 very hard to make sure that everybody gets the same information at the same time. And that includes international buyers. So if I've talked to a lot of international buyers because of the, some of the programs we hear of it, have at NDSU, and USDA is still considered the most reliable source of information they have, not only about what's happening in the US, but many times about what's happening in their own countries. Okay, the other final comment I'll make before I dive into the numbers is the, the USDA, understand that when the market evaluates this, the USDA information is one source. Now they put a lot of weight on that. That's, that's still considered kind of the gold standard of information, but it's still only one piece of information. And they do combine that with all of the other things that are going on in the marketplace to try and say, well, does this make sense? Is the information valid? Does it, does it essentially meet my biases? So let's just dive right into the numbers. Now, I don't have time in today's uh, report uh, to really talk about all of the information that came out. There's well over a hundred pages of tables and numbers I, I've dug through a lot of that information and trying to synthesize it. So on my next slide, um, I'm gonna start out with the production report. So there's an annual production report where USDA com comes out with their final numbers for harvested acreage, national average yields, as well as yields by state, as well as total production by, at the national level as, as well as by state. I want you to focus in on, on three, three lines. The top line, which is highlighted in blue, is the, what the trade was expecting to see. So this was the average of a survey of private analysts. 
saying, what number do you think USDA is going to release in these reports? And, and the, the surveys are conducted by Reuters and Bloomberg and uh, Wall Street Journal as well as others. Um, the moral is these private forecasters put their best guess to, estimate together. Okay. And the average of that is, is the blue line on the very top. We have the highest trade estimate, the lowest trade estimate. The black line that's highlighted towards the bottom um, is, last, is last month's information. So that was the information in the uh, December production report, actually technically November uh, production report. And then the uh, red line on the bottom is the numbers we got on Tuesday. So I really want to compare... The, the, the blue row at the very top with the red, row, red um, row on the very bottom, because that's really the, what moves the market. It's not what we saw back in, in November or December. It's really what do we expect to happen? So the trade was expecting, for example, corn yields to be cut slightly in this final, um, final January report for the 2020 production year. But the reduction we got was much larger than expected. And so what happened last month or the previous report really isn't the key. It's what is the trade expecting to see? Because those expectations are already bid into prices. That's already booked into especially the futures market. So on the next slide, all I did was highlighted the, the two key numbers that came out of this particular report. The surprise in the marketplace first and foremost was the corn yield. The national average corn yield was taken down much lower than anybody was really expecting to see. Now, a 172 as a national average corn yield is still, is still pretty good, but it's lower than we thought the number would be. And as a result, then total production, the total amount of bushels we have available in the system is also lower. On the soybean side, again, the trade was expecting to see a slight slippage, a slight reduction in soybean yields, but it was, again, kind of a little bit larger than most people would expect. So we already have some very tight margins on soybeans, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and so any, any small change in the soybean market for the supply side or the demand side is going to have a big price response. But the biggest surprise, in my opinion, it was really that corn yield and the corn production number dropping as much as it did. On the next slide, um, I'm going to shift into the quarterly stocks report. So every quarter, every three months, USDA does a massive survey of not only farmers, but also all of the commercial handlers of grain and say, how much grain do you have on inventory on a particular date? Well, even though we got the numbers in, in the first part of January now, the, the survey was actually taken in December. So these are estimates for the amount of grain in the system as of December 1. I've also now circle, circled and highlighted the, the corn stocks number. And again, that was the number that was a bit surprising to everybody, but it really confirms or helps cross validate the fact that yes, we did have a lower crop than we had expected. Um, because in this, in this quarterly time period, we, haven't, we have consumption of corn, both in ethanol as well as exports and feed demand, but it's, it's those numbers um, are, really haven't hit their peak, okay? The moral of, moral of the story is this lower corn, um, inventory number, the grain stocks number, the amount that we have on December 1, again, adds validity to the fact that we didn't have as much production as we first expected. If you compare the, the blue line and the uh, red line in soybeans and wheat, um, they were both uh, uh, very close to what the industry ex was expecting, but again, the shock really was in the corn number. On my next slide, uh, we'll shift gears again. We'll talk a little bit about ending stocks. So this would be actually for the WASDE report, the supply and demand estimates. So this is the, the, the set of information that combines not only the production uh, numbers and carryover numbers from last year and saying how many bushels do we have available within our system, but also what do we expect the total consumption or usage to be for this particular marketing year? And, and then the question is, well, what's the bottom line? How much grain do we expect to have in inventory, in, in reserves, going into the harvest of 2021. Now, when we compare, once again, the, the, the blue line on top, which is what the great train, grain trade was expecting, versus the red one on the bottom, which is the actual numbers, you'll see that these came out actually surprisingly close. If anything, the wheat ending stocks number was a bit lower than what the trade was expecting. It's kind of at the very low end of the range. 
with corn and soybeans being very close to what the trade was expecting. Now, the, the conflict in people's mind is, well, if we had this big reduction in corn and, we just, and a cutback in soybeans, why didn't we see more of a reduction in those ending stocks numbers? And, and in particular for corn, it was because the USDA also adjusted the consumption. They adjusted their forecasts for usage numbers. They took all of the three major categories of feed demand, ethanol demand, as well as exports, and they reduced those just a little bit. And the reason they did that was because if, as we have less bushels available, average prices will go higher. As average prices go higher, it starts to ration usage. And, and on the feed side, it starts to look at some substitution effects. And that's one of the reasons that the wheat number dropped more than expected. It's because when USDA made the adjustments, they cut the, the feed usage for corn, but they slightly increased the feed usage for wheat. So there's some substitution going on. Look at the relative prices of corn versus wheat, in particular into some of the feedlots, for example, in, in Kansas and Oklahoma, and um, Kansas and, and Colorado. Some of that substitution is, is, is pretty legitimate. Okay, up, if you can uh, go to the next slide, please. There we go. So these are the ending stocks numbers. Now these are in absolute bushels and it, it does give you a perspective on you know, where we're at, but a better way of, in my opinion, of looking at these ending stocks is to look at it relative to history. So on the next slide, this is the ending stocks numbers for corn. So the green line on top is total production. The red line is total consumption of corn in the United States. The blue bars in the bottom is what's gonna focus on. I've talked about this graphic before. Those blue bars represents that stocks to use ratio. So we're looking at our ending stocks in bushels divided by our total consumption, or our total needs. So what percentage of our ending stocks are we gonna have in reserve in case there's a problem going into next year? So how much, do, how much grain are we gonna have in inventory percentage wise just before harvest? So the blue bars are the historical stocks to use ratio. It's scaled on the far right hand side. The red bar you notice is the current USDA forecast. So this is updated for the January numbers. And that red bar did slip just a little bit. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's now we're getting to those, this pricing range where ending stocks and corn are starting to get a little bit tight. What I, what I traditionally say, because I've looked at this historically, when we get to that 10% carryover stocks number, a 10% stocks to use ratio, if, if the stocks to use is above that, the corn market feels pretty comfortable and they're, they're not really concerned. So we tend to have lower average prices, more stable prices. That inflection point, that tipping point between kind of being comfortable and being uncomfortable is about that, in my, my assessment, about at that 10% level, which is really where we're at right now today. So if our ending stocks get below 10%, what tends to happen is we start to get more, uh, more price movement upwards. We're starting to see that in the marketplace, but we also tend to have more volatility. Prices get a lot more sensitive to new information and changes in our expectations. And that's really, I think, what Tim was referring to in his talk is that as you start to change and adjust uh, corn prices, that has a direct impact then on what, what cattle prices will do. Now, just for reference points, we're at about 10.6% right now based on the current forecast. Back in 2012, uh, which is the last time we had really tight stocks, we were at about a 7.4% carryover. And back in 1995, which is the record low, we were about 5% carryover. Okay, so you understand now we're, we're starting to get into this range where the, the corn market's feeling a little bit uncomfortable and they're starting to get a little nervous about what this might look like as we move forward. On the next slide, I've done the exact same thing for soybeans. So I won't describe the blue bars. It's, it's the same interpretation. Uh, please notice that red bar on the far right-hand side. That is the current USDA forecast for ending stocks as a percentage of use. Uh, that number is actually 3.1%. Our record low was back in 2012 at 2.6%. So we're now getting down so those carryover stocks levels that are very, very close to the record low. And you're starting to see, obviously, the soybean market respond to that. One of the other things I've been watching now in the last week or so is the price spread between old crop and new crop soybeans. Okay, so if we're looking at the, what's the price relation? New crop soybean, I mean, old crop soybeans have really taken off. If you look at the March contract 
on soybean futures, it's really taken off and gone crazy. If you look at the November futures for delivery at harvest, that price differential has, is, is widening out, which means the old crop prices are rising much faster than the new crop prices are. And right now we've got about a $2.50 spread price differential between those two crops. If you go back, you know, literally a little over a week ago, about a week and a half ago, it, it was close to a dollar a bushel difference. So what that also signals to me is that the market's getting very, very, very concerned about our old crop supplies. There just really isn't much left in the pipeline that hasn't already been committed, that hasn't already been purchased or has an ownership stake, and not necessarily at the farm level, but more importantly, at the commercial level. So again, this is one of the reasons we're seeing soybean prices going very, very high, average prices increasing, but wait, hang on, we will see higher volatility. And that means both prices going up and going down, depending upon the new information we have in the marketplace. All right, the next slide is the same exact thing, but for wheat. Now this is for all wheat, it's all classes of wheat blended together, not just specifically spring wheat. But this is going to, the reason I used all wheat is because it's going to play into my next discussion about planted acreage coming into 2021. When we look our, at our reserves of wheat, and again, not getting class specific, we're very comfortable in our, our ending stocks of wheat. The inventories of wheat in the US are very comfortable right now. What I typically say is an, a typical or average ending stocks number, because we tend to carry a little bit more wheat anyway, is between 30 and 35%. Uh, uh, carryover stocks is kind of that typical ratio. Well, we're currently at about 39%. Back in 2007, eight, remember it's spring of 2008 when, when spring wheat prices and, and, and winter wheat prices went absolutely nuts. Our ending stocks number was about 13.2. So we, we need to have those wheat ending stocks to get a little tighter before the wheat market really starts to get nervous. So what's, what's driving the wheat market right now is not necessarily what's happening directly in the wheat market, but what's happening in the corn and soybean market. And as I said, USDA is already recognizing that we may see some substitution. There may be some, some wheat that would have may, may have been in the export market or going into the, into the domestic uh, milling market that now might be diverted into the livestock feeding sector. So the wheat market is gonna have to, have to work pretty hard to prevent too much wheat being diverted into the corn into the corn market as a corn substitute. All right, my next slide. I'm almost there, guys. Hang on. Um, just a quick update on South American production. USDA really didn't adjust South American production for corn and soybeans in Brazil and Argentina a lot. There were some adjustments in Argentina. Uh, the USDA numbers actually are tracking relatively close to what the private forecasters or private estimates are saying. Um, the Brazilian uh, crop, uh, USDA has been a little bit slower to adjust their expectations. Some of the private estimates are looking for bigger, uh, bigger adjustments, a downward adjustment. They're looking for average corn and average soybean yields to be cut a little bit more just because of some of the weather challenges they've had over the last several months. So I, I do expect over time, USDA may, may, may tighten these up a little bit, but these are still some very, very big numbers, especially coming out of Brazil. So no major adjustments here. There wasn't really any shock value in this, but it is something that we're going to have to watch very closely as we move forward. Next slide. Um, so the last report, the last big report that came out on Tuesday was the winter wheat seedings report. And the importance of the winter wheat seedings report is that now we're gonna to have to start playing this game of how many acres of what crop is gonna be planted. Now, obviously the winter wheat crop has already been seeded. If price relationships change or the weather conditions change, you know, winter wheat can be ripped up and replanted into something else. But given the drier conditions, you saw the drought monitor map that, that Tim showed, uh, a lot of the hard red winter wheat area anyway is in pretty dry condition right now. So the likelihood that you're gonna rip up some of the hard red winter wheat and put in, let's say a corn or soybean is, is relatively low. When we look at soft red winter wheat, which right now actually has the highest market price is soft red winter wheat. Usually that's the lowest market price. There's a, been a pretty strong incentive for those, those farmers that are in the, the soft red winter wheat producing regions to hold onto those acres. The same case for white winter wheat. 
So if we look at the total numbers at what the trade was expecting, which is the blue, what the actual number said, which is the red. And in this case, what I really wanna do is compare the red, red row or red line with the black one. The, what, what, what do we do last year? So based on the USDA survey, it looks like we're gonna add about 1.5 million acres of winter wheat over last year's number. Now, the interesting thing is we, as we move forward, the market is signaling very, very strong that we need to have an increase in soybean acres. We need to look at increasing soybean production to meet the demand base that's already kind of booked into or plugged into the system. But we can't necessarily lose a lot of corn acres either because our corn balance sheet is starting to tighten up as well. So the fact that we've got an increase in hard red winter wheat seedings is also now chewing into, okay, how many acres are actually gonna be available to start switching crops or start shifting around as we get into the 2021 planting season. So the next, next slide is simply a statement saying, look, the battle has begun. And I think there's more and more press uh, talking about that. We're gonna have this discussion about given relative prices, what are farmers gonna plant in 2021 and how is all this gonna play out? And for North Dakota, this is gonna be really important because we are one of those swing states. My final slide, and I, I apologize for taking up so much time. I just wanted to give a historical perspective on, on planted acreage. So the, uh, the gold, one, gold line on top is corn plantings. The green is soybean plantings. The brown is wheat plantings, all wheat. And then the, the, the fourth and fifth largest acreage crops we have as far as annual production is cotton and sorghum. And, and I, you know, some people say, well, can't we steal some more acres from cotton or from, some, some, from sorghum? Well, yeah, but if we steal too much, that makes a big change in their supply demand balance sheet as well. And cotton prices have been going crazy as well as sorghum. So I think it's going to be really easy to, or very difficult, excuse me, to try and pull additional acres from some of these uh, smaller acreage crops as we move forward. So with that, I'll be quiet and I'll hand things over to Dave. I apologize for the length. Shocking frame. <laughs> It's good stuff. Uh, yeah, so I'm just going to make some brief comments about the corn ethanol markets. Uh, there's a lot going on, uh, even in light and in, in, in light of, of what happened on Tuesday with the announcements uh, with supplies. Really, you know, up until that point, we were looking at international factors, you know, using up a lot of corn and the things were going to get tight. Uh, we also saw some some building of stocks, and now uh, things are 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 a little bit more dire than than. Than they were a few days ago. Again, we now you know have a, a much smaller corn crop according to USDA. Uh, that demand for corn elsewhere uh, is, is going to be really hard to compete against. Uh, and then in all of this too, you know, we have this relatively weak fuel demand. It is winter. It is the shutdown season, but we're seeing really high stocks uh, in in corn ethanol, which is, is really depressing. If you've heard in the last week or two, there's some, you know, announced permanent shutdowns of, of some ethanol refining capacity uh, in the industry. One of those was, you know, a wet corn mill that simply wasn't going to make ethanol anymore. Uh, also going along with that too is some uncertainty in policy, both at the federal level uh, and a little bit of optimism or some, some positive news from state level policies. So just to talk really briefly about what's going on in terms of margins. Again, I, I go to the South Dakota ethanol numbers pretty often because there's no North Dakota numbers. Uh, but just to kind of see where they're at. So right now, you know, they're reporting, and this is the, the you know, basically what's happening last week in South Dakota, paying almost $5 for corn tracking, you know, pretty closely, uh, you know, much higher than they've been paying, you know, a few weeks, a few months ago, and hurting margins. Distillers grains have been solid, you know, around that $200 mark. Corn oil is high. And then really what's hitting them is the ethanol, the ethanol prices, uh, has really weakened in the last few weeks. We're up to about a dollar fifty for a bit, which might have made uh, four dollars four eighty five corn uh, workable. Uh, and now we're down to that 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 simple crush again. Not talking about other operating or or capital expenses, but a forty cents a gallon. Again, I I would just use this really quick rule of thumb of fifty cents a gallon being break even. And so we're clearly below that. And and really kind of looking forward, uh, think about what's going on fundamentally in the market. Uh, you know, corn, I don't see any savior in terms of, of, of corn prices coming down significantly. And I can certainly see downward pressure on, on ethanol prices, again, as those stocks build. Probably the biggest news longer term, what's going to go on this year, is what we're going to be doing with the RFS. 
And so the uh, administration uh, did not announce uh, renewable volume obligations for 2021 uh, for, for most of the fuels. They, they kind of kicked the can down the road and the Biden administration uh, has that, uh, is going to be able to make that call. Interestingly, you know, EPA actually did send it up to the White House in June, uh, the numbers that they, they, that they calculated using uh, their methods. White House just basically never finalized the numbers. And so there's a lot of uncertainty there exactly where, where uh, the Biden administration uh, might see biofuels. And again, this is in light of COVID. This is in light of uh, other concerns. And it really might be a signal to the market of, of what the, the Biden administration thinks about biofuels. You know, are they a fundamental part of decarbonizing transportation or are they going to lean more heavily on electric vehicles and the like? Uh, also, really big news of what's going on. So the Supreme Court did announce uh, in the last week that they are going to pick up a uh, a case from the appeals uh, circuit, basically saying, you know, did did the administration err um, when issuing small refinery waivers? The the uh, biofuels industry is a little upset that they did that because the, the appeals court decision was in their favor, basically saying that, you know, EPA had, had violated uh, the law by doing that. Uh, so we're going to have to wait until, you know, August or September to see what the Supreme Court uh, finally says. Uh, also a little bit troubling in something we'll know within the next week is there's a lot of thoughts that the administration, the current administration, the Trump administration, uh, might issue uh, many more small refinery waivers between now and next Wednesday. Uh, they, they certainly could do that, and all that would do is, is muddy the water, muddy the water further. Um, you know, in terms of, of the RFS and its actual impact on on those things it was originally designed to do. You know, the, the little bit of good news in all of this is that a lot of the state level uh, low carbon fuel policies are really taking hold. The California market is strong. There's look at a lot of states to you know, create those cap and trade models. Frank asked me just before we came on, you know, is there something like that at the federal level? And I'm sure there's gonna be, you know, there's gonna be a bill, there's gonna be discussion. I don't think we're ready for cap and trade, but at, at the state level, uh, it, it's really coming on strong. What we're gonna see, unlike during the Trump administration, a lot of states, especially California, you know, decided that they were gonna pick up the standard and run with it in terms of uh, environmentally uh, beneficial uh, fuel policies. And now we have the Biden administration, which certainly sees this as a priority, but exactly how they do it remains to be seen. So those are our comments now that we're kind of back on track, a little bit behind schedule because of our initial delay. But I would invite any of you to uh, ask a question, either using the Q&A tool or the chat function um, and, and give you a chance to do that. As you might be thinking of questions, posting those questions, uh, just remember that we will have another webinar uh, Thursday. Uh, February 11th. So that'll be right after the next WASD report. And then also you can check out the slides and a recording of this and other webinars at the, the, the Outlook webpage with the URLs on the, on the screen there. I already mentioned some folks weren't able to make it online today. They'll definitely uh, be reminded that the webinar is there. And of course, if you want to come back and listen to any or all of this or the, the webinar from December, you're very welcome to do that. Um, I'm not seeing any questions coming up, I uh, must have been quite thorough. I would ask is, do any of the panelists have any questions or thoughts or, or comments about their or any other presenters remarks? Or are we all I, just- I really, I really don't have anything else to add, I'm sorry. <laughs> Without going on for another 20 minutes, I, yeah. uh, anyway. <laughs> I did see one. Oh, always great. Well, thank you. Thank you for the, the compliment, Marcia. We appreciate that. We do like the positive feedback. The only piece of news I would tell everyone, which is not related to agriculture directly, but the uh, state legislature is considering having a, a 10 or 11th month school year, either this year or next year, because students have fallen behind. So that may affect a lot of us, maybe not at work, but in other aspects of our life. So that'll be interesting. I want to thank everybody for, for, for calling in today. We hope we can see you uh, in February. Thanks.